Um, ladies and gentlemen, I feel very happy to be invited to this very auspicious occasion on the issue of fighting corruption and the direct involvement <clears throat> of the young people. The theme is fighting corruption now and in the future. And it expresses some hope about what our young people can do in the future. Because I don't think many of us are happy about how the adults are dealing with corruption, honesty, and more precisely with integrity. And the reference by Mr. Abdul made to my presence in parliament exposed me to the vagaries and the challenges of dealing with corruption at the policy and legislative levels. And there are some disappointments there, but I want to congratulate Mr. Abdul, his executive, and the Transparency International Unit in Trinidad and Tobago for persisting over the years in raising concerns about corruption. Corruption at the level at which we are dealing with can poison a community. It has been doing so. And if you are worried about what is happening to the Caribbean in terms of the indices of not only corruption, but competitiveness, doing business, governance, it tells you something about the work that we have to do. At the same time, and especially for the young people, I must tell you, there is a lot of hope. I have, been, I have visited about 100 schools in the country at a certain period when I was at UE and also the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And I am surprised at the number of well-meaning students, ambitious aspirations. And I think what has misled us to exaggerate our concerns, although there are legitimate concerns, but sometimes they can be exaggerated through the media. Now you have to understand the dynamics of the media in terms of the perception of corruption. Every headline has something bad about it, generally, and that's the nature of news. It has a marketing challenge to publish what people want, and that's the nature of democracy. It's cyclical, what the market wants, business, more so the media must try to satisfy. So I know this might sound trivial, but it is fundamental in dealing with corruption. Because the work of Transparency International, for example, it wouldn't make much news. You wouldn't get a headline except somebody comes at your conference and, as you say, bust a mark about somebody thiefing money or some parliamentarian have a mall in Holland and The Hague and so on or you're paying contractors, and then you will get the publicity, which you really don't want in such a way. So we are dealing with corruption in a democracy. And before I move on, I must congratulate once again the work of Transparency International. <laughs> really, really, really. The volunteerism, which is what it is about, and the spirit with which you undertake your tasks over the years, Dion, you and your executive really deserve public commendation for that. It is volunteer work. I know something about volunteer work. Issued invitations, making sure your speaker is here. Up to this evening at five o'clock, he keeps calling me, you coming, you coming? Well, like, yeah, I know I'm coming, but the, the, the diligence of the effort. You see, I am going to focus some of what I'm saying on the young people because young people have connected experiences. It growing up connected to the parents, home, schooling connected to the education system, about which many of us have serious concerns in shaping the minds, the attitudes, the behavior of the young people through the education system. And that is the challenge that we also have to look at 
if you want to get output from young people as they're growing up, dealing with integrity and feeling that corruption should be shamed and prevented. But you see, we live in a democracy, and that is part of the problem that some of you might be surprised to hear. Democracy traditionally means you have fair and free elections, one man, one vote. You have an independent judiciary, separation of powers, and most of those are structural elements. More precisely, in terms of the Constitution, in Section 4 of the Constitution, and which I suggest all young people in secondary schools should become very familiar with that part of the Constitution. Because while it provides rights and freedoms, the accompanying corollary to that Section 4 should be duty and responsibilities. And I don't find much of that in the Constitution. Surprisingly, you might find it in socialist countries, communist countries, where you almost order people how to behave with sanctions. But a democracy leaves that an open space. You have freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, the right to property, freedom of speech. You have those freedoms guaranteed through the courts. But between those freedoms, you have a lot of space in order to be a democracy. And it is between those spaces that the criminals operate. And it's difficult to stop them. You can't enter somebody's home, even though you suspect them. There are a lot of rules, a procedure, probability, freedom of speech, freedom of movement. One of the big issues now is transnational crime, which involves freedom of movement. And you can hear from the legislature and all around the world, there are serious difficulties in creating borders around transnational movement in dealing with crime. Because this is a democracy. So if you want to be a democracy, the behavior of citizens must also count in that freedom, in that space. And that is where the, dif the difficulty exists. And my thesis is, you will never free any society from corruption. It might disturb you, but that is a fact, because if you want to be a democracy, you must leave spaces for those freedoms to be operationalized. And we have a lot of greedy people. And greed is the fundamental leverage for corruption. You want more. You always want more. A man never feels rich. Because every morning he gets up, he's thinking about how to get more. We have no problem with getting more. But you can do it in the honest way. But you want to fast track the greed, so you take the shortcuts to subvert the democracy that gives you all these freedoms. So it will not eradicate crime either. Neither will it eradicate poverty. You could manage, control, help to prevent the institutions we have, but there's the police the ministries, the parliament, intelligence agencies, the United Nations effort, and all those treaties and so on. But because people are in the center, what you call human nature, long ago there were many philosophers who tried to deal with this problem of having these freedoms and yet have a decent corruption-free society. One person said, well, everybody can't be a ruler, so you have philosopher kings, people who want nothing except to govern honestly. That was Plato. Another fellow come, as you might have heard about him, Thomas Hobbes. He said, you need a strong person at top there to control all these greedy people and all these wayward people. 
And other people said, no, that is a dictatorship. And so you came down philosopher after philosopher, Adam Schmidt, the reciprocity between the public good and your individual interests. Never solved that problem. We're still struggling with it as Abdul mentioned. So we are in a struggle. And I don't want to dampen your hopes about being anti-corruption. You will always have corruption. It is part of human nature, or what they used to call a state of nature. Jesus had 12, and one left him. That's a good example. He wanted 30 pieces of silver. If in that domain, in Adam and Eve, the temptation was there. So with the young people, so those are my concerns about corruption. We can't give up. We have to continue to fight and keep it down. Because one of the serious consequences committed by the corrupt is to discourage and demoralize the young people who fall in line with that, the easy way. And that is why I want to celebrate the name you have here, Leon Reyes. Is he here? Is he? Leon? Yeah, I want to share with Transparency International in the award they're giving you for your honesty and good citizenship. So, when we are speaking about the question of corruption and lack of integrity, it talks about the education system. And good as it might be, in terms of the person with the best ability, academic ability, getting into the first hundred, or the first three, with all these celebrations that we witnessed in the newspaper with the minister, the fundamental deficiency in the education system is the lack of opportunity and a curriculum to develop a civic mind, to develop a good citizen. Because in that scramble to pass your maths, your English, and your comprehension, your essay, you leave behind a lot of other subjects which are useful for character building. As you know, there was once a subject called civics. There's nothing near to that now. People don't know about their institutions. And if they are not socialized into the presence, functions of institutions that govern them from young secondary schools, when they grow into adulthood, they would not be soaked into it. Their consciousness would not accommodate the meaning of those institutions. It will merely be superficial. So the education system has to start dealing more fundamentally and operationally. That is, develop the concept in the curriculum and let the teachers start teaching it in the most practical, interactive way. And that is something perhaps we could look at along, <coughs> along the way. Because integrity doesn't drop from the sky. As I say, the young people are, inter, they are interconnected. And as the tree is bent, as the twig is bent, sorry, as the twig is bent, so shall the tree grow. And there's a lot of research in child development and adolescent development that point to that process. Training from early age. And we're not doing enough of that. What our young people are seeing today and witnessing is a lot of corruption, allegations, implications of corruption at high places. And sometimes you can't speak too loudly about these things because there is a reaction, especially if you're an NGO, you might find your funding cut off. So you have to walk very carefully and learn the art of diplomacy with Mr. Clark. Where's Clark? Clark was a lecturing to diplomats and so on. But it's part of the problem. Related to corruption and so on is the question of shame. Now, shame is a very valuable cultural commodity. Whatever you might think about the tribes of Africa, 
with a backward culture in India, you will call them backward because of their dress and the food and the way they live. The element of shame kept them organized, respectable, and they had integrity in their poverty. Because people feel only rich people would have integrity. But people can be poor and still have integrity. That was a long time. Where I grew up, Sour Hill and Quarry Road, around Wes, well, my mother took me a lot of places. I was a transient child. I was Plumita, Sugwana, Curep. That's another part of my history, which one of these days I'll have to write about it. Because it did affect me in some ways, you know. But that's another story. I don't know how many of you are reading Newsday on a Sunday. I know the price has risen, but you could still buy it. No, I'm not the marketing agent for <laughs> Newsday. But my interest is, I've written about integrity, corruption, uh, and the politics of it. But this Sunday, I'm writing about a smart man society. So if you get time or you could borrow it, take a look at it. Because this is a smart man society. The recent incident is with the housing. People living in the houses, although they have no legal right to live in it. A fellow in the ministry, he's selling the house without having a legal position to do so. He has no official capacity, but he tells the lady and the couple, don't worry man, I have a contact inside, I know somebody inside. And the lady paid the money, and so now the police has investigated. And when they investigate the housing, they found a lot of other people living there illegally, put there by people illegally after taking money. The licensing office, you pay $15,000, they tell you, well, I will get your license for you. He never paid anybody, but by chance you would pass on your own strength. So when you pass, he tells you, you see, see what I do for you, I have a man inside there, you know anybody else who wants a license. People selling other people's land with false deeds. And innocent people, victim to these smart men. Many more examples. Because you trust the person, the word of trust. Trust can be abused. Somebody desperate for facility, a house, whatever it is, public commodity, and somebody comes and says, Dora, I could get it for you, God. We have plenty of those people in the country. Where they come from? They come from the schools. And if you look at the 16, 17, 18 year old boys now, in the early 20s, you now see them lining up against a wall with the police guns behind them. Where they came from? The schools, families. They didn't drop from the sky physically, but they were socialized out of the system. Many of them don't feel they don't belong to the system. And the deleterious effect of being marginal and feeling out of a system, you have no interest in the system. There's no motive, there's no motive for you to protect, support the system, support anti-corruption drive. You have no interest in it. You seek refuge in other places. Gangs, drug pushing. I did some research in juvenile homes some years ago, and I was surprised at the number of girls that are deemed beyond control by their parents, beyond control at 11, 12 years old. Took them to the police station, and they put them in the juvenile homes. Boys too, St. Michael's and all those other places, St. Jude's and so on. So it's the institutions and not only the Public Service Commission or the Judiciary or the Police Service Commission or the Teaching Service Commission. Institutions are most fundamentally in terms of dealing and shaping the minds of children that they will have integrity and they will have the vigor and spirit to fight corruption it will start family and the schools. 
my view is that I know you have done some, a lot of work with the schools, but given this year's theme, I think you could, each secondary school should have a human rights and public safety council attached to Transparency International. And some of the issues I'm talking about, or other people might talk about it similarly, can be presented at these councils where you'll have a committed president, a secretary, and so on. But you've got to operationalize the objective from the school level. Now, when we speak about young people, we have to prepare them. But we have to understand that they too have problems, serious problems. I, I have come across some government reports, and there are more than what is in the reports, but just refer to the report. Teenage pregnancies are running wild. You ask any medical doctor or any clinic, when you have teenage pregnancies, it doesn't end there. You become parents. And how can you be, you know, somebody had a headline, children making children. That is to emphasize the point. So, so a child growing up with a 15, 16 year old mother, they could pitch marbles or play hopscotch together. <laughs> the parent is not capable mentally, socially, Worse yet, economically, because the father has disappeared. So this is the era of the heartless fathers who make these children and disappear. And all we read about in the papers is a single mother with three children looking for a home. This morning's paper. And we say, you know, single, single mothers causing crime. She's not causing the crime. The conditions in which she lives contribute to crime. And how those conditions arrive? In large measure, ladies and gentlemen, by these fatherless homes, about whom we hear very little about, as if they are invisible. They commit their performance, to put it very mildly. They take off heartless, reckless, and with many other Mothers. So you have a bunch of single mothers in the country now without the resources to nurture their children in the proper way. So when you expect the young people to take up the struggle of anti-corruption, yes, you will have a lot of them, but there could be more. Because the ones from homes which suffer from such deleterious consequences will contribute to the delinquency and a lot of the crime and violence that we're hearing about. The phenomenon that is causing extreme disturbance across the world is trafficking in children, and we have a lot of that trafficking in Trinidad and Tobago now. You read only the tip of the iceberg in the newspapers. Because I'll tell you the truth. If you talk to the police confidentially and other social workers, they'll tell you, some mothers glad to get rid of their children because they can't afford to mind them properly, mainly because this father come, he drop his oats or his seeds, as it, whatever it might be, I think he's gone. But I think we should put more emphasis on these heartless fathers. Really, I think they, you know, they get it away, as you would say, with murder. I think that's enough time, eh? <laughs> well, I have some other things, but next time. But I think you, you get my drift, you know? Yeah. Democracy is a challenge to live in because of the freedoms and rights it guarantees, which are all exploited by the criminal. Secondly, young people should take up the challenge because there is opportunity in the schools. Thirdly, the education ministry and all those educators in us should make sure that the curriculum is designed to develop good character civic-mindedness, apart from the academic subjects, and thirdly, the home is a vital instrument adversely affected by these reckless, heartless fathers who make children run away and leave the single mothers carrying the burden. 
Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs>